Thank you all for joining us this evening on the London Art Week public programming. Um, thanks must go to uh, London Art Week for this discerning platform that they provide London art dealers, academics, and art enthusiasts. Um, it's really become a very valuable asset to London, and we're all very grateful to you. Tonight, we are talking about a very unique loan of four bronzes, uh, from four Renaissance bronzes from the Bargello to the Detroit Institute of Art. This loan denotes a very long cultural exchange between Detroit and Florence, but more specifically between the Detroit Institute of Art and the Bargello. The talk that we have planned for you tonight is fascinating in that it covers a lot of different areas uh, and um, including the, this cultural exchange. Um, and the interest of the Friends of the Bargello within this, within this exchange is, is quite simple. We, as a charity, support many aspects, uh, ongoing aspects of uh, research and publication at the Bargello. But one of our large parts of our mission statement is to extend awareness of the Bargello and its, and its world-class collections. So to support a loan of like this to Detroit is very much within our mission statement. And if it can bring more awareness uh, to the collections at the Bargello, then we're certainly doing part of what we're setting out to do as a charity. I'm Catherine Zock, and I'm the Vice President and Director of the Friends of the Bargello. And with me tonight um, is a panel of three, one of which is Dimitri Zikos, who I'm very fortunate to be able to develop the Friends of the Bargello with. He's the president of the Friends of the Bargello. And together we started the charity in about, I, I suppose, officially in 2015, but in earnest um, a couple years after that. And we're very proud to say that we're now making very significant and meaningful donations and support to the Bargello. Um, and we're incredibly grateful to our very committed donors and of all of which is, is, is growing each year. So we're very thankful to that. Um, also on our panel is Alan Dar, um, who's the senior curator of European art department and the Walter B. Ford the second family curator of European sculpture and decorative arts at the Detroit Institute of Arts. He has amazingly been at the museum for 45 years. And within that time, I think it's 45, <laughs> within, within that time has made uh, extraordinary contributions curatorially to the collections at the DIA. And I think, um, it's unarguable that the collections of the DIA are among, or the Renaissance collections of the DIA are certainly among the top three in America. Next on our panel is uh, Benedetta Maria Matucci, who is a curator at the Museo, de, Museo del Bargelli, Bargello. And it's been a real privilege to get to know Benedetta throughout this process. She is uh, currently uh, the curator um, of a specific and wonderful exhibition that one should see if they're in Florence at the moment, which coincides with restorations projects at the Musee, um, at the Orsan Michele. And it's the three, three large bronzes are on view in the exhibition space at the Bargello, the uh, Gilberti of St. John the Baptist, the Verrocchio uh, uh, Christ and St. Thomas, Doubting Thomas, and John Bologna's St. Luke. And between them, between these three large bronzes is 185 years of Florentine bronze history. And it's really, really magnificent to see it uh, in place. And it's been a, a wonderful exhibition and I hope as many of you uh, can see it as possible because it is a, a real privilege to see these large bronzes within this space. 
this exhibition, um, these, this loan of four bronzes, which we'll introduce in just a moment, is uh, in honor of a, of a special focus exhibition, which Alan Dar has been instrumental in, uh, in beginning at the DIA. And they're called Guests of Honor. Um, and they're special exhibitions that happen um, annually. And he'll tell you more about it. But this slide will show you exactly when this exhibition is on, which is September 30th to March. And the Friends of the Bargello will be taking a group um, to this exhibition. So any of you that are interested, please get in touch with us. And um, you'll be hearing more about the exhibition, obviously, as we go forward. Um, this is the Bargello. For those of you who don't know, this magnificent building, which is uh, the oldest building in Florence, older than Palazzo Vecchio, and has gone through many manifestations in its, in its history, um, and is really one of the beating hearts of the city. Um, uh, and I'd like to introduce Benedetta to speak uh, very briefly on the history of its collections and how, how the Bargello came to be a museum. Thanks, Benedetta. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for your kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure. I will um, produce the first slide depicting the exterior of the Museo Nazionale del Bargello, one of the main museums in Florence and uh, home to the most important uh, collection of Italian Renaissance, uh, Renaissance culture worldwide. De Bargello and the director Paolo D'Agostino have uh, promptly joined the collaborative uh, project promoted by the DIA, granting such an important uh, loan of the four bronzes that we are going to talk uh, um, about uh, this evening. The extraordinary collection of De Bargello are preserved, preserved inside this medieval uh, building. Uh, the construction of the building started uh, in the mid the 13th century and then it was fortified uh, and large and rich and uh, in 1865 uh, the museum uh, was opened and uh, it was uh, in a very short time enriched uh, with uh, the most different typologies of wonderful works uh, such as uh, such as uh, ivories medals maiolica arms uh, placed side by side with renaissance uh, sculptures uh, I think it can be said, Catherine, uh, that uh, uh, the collection of the Bargello tell uh, the story of uh, Florence uh, like no other museum in Florence uh, does. And uh, this has been uh, uh, possible uh, thanks uh, to several important donations and to the acquisition of a part of the heritage uh, of uh, the Medici and the, fam and the Lorraine families. Uh, the same illustrious provenance uh, that uh, three of the four bronzes meant to be protagonist in the oncoming exhibition in Detroit uh, can, uh, can boast. And uh, this is uh, to introduce. <laughs> to... Thank you. Thank you, Benedetta. Uh, Alan, I'd love for you to talk about uh, this collaborative exhibition. Uh, well, it, initially, please, your collaboration with Florence. And this being the most recent collaboration at the Donatello exhibition, which we all enjoyed in 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And um, well, exactly. The concept of the uh, get wonderful guests of honor exhibition we're borrowing from the Bargello came about really just a year ago, exactly, when I was in Florence and to see the great exhibition on Donatello, the Renaissance, that was there from last spring until uh, into the July. Um, and we had lent for the first time ever, this extraordinary terracotta, the seated enthroned uh, Madonna and child, uh, previously attributed, now given to Donatello, uh, not only by Francesco Caliotti, but 40 years ago by Luciano Bellosi and others. And I had this in an exhibition that I organized um, back in 1985 and 86 with Florence. And this, we lent it for the first time. Uh, we could only lend it to one site. It couldn't go to Berlin or, or the VNA because of its fragility. Our objects conservator took it over. It is a amazing terracotta that we were fortunate to receive in 1940 as a gift from Ralph Harmon Booth. Um, and it was shown prominently in the very 
the first areas you walked into the exhibition with other terracottas by Donatello and his followers. So as I went to the Palazzo Strozzi and then to the Barcello, I began to think, well, maybe there could be a, an idea percolating. And uh, if we go on to the next slide, I want to give some background about the collaboration I've had in the museum, our museum even predating me, has had with, um, with Florence uh, and with the Florentine museums. Um, I know that when the great tragedy of the flood occurred in 1966, that uh, patrons of our museum, led by Henry, the Se Henry Ford II and his wife and, and our director then, uh, rallied and raised money to help support the, um, the conservation for the, of the works of art after the flood. And through that activity led to an exhibition was really a groundbreaking exhibition held in Florence at Palazzo Pitti and, and uh, uh, called the Twilight of the Medici, Le Ultima Medici in Italian, a late Baroque art in Florence from 1670 to 1743. And great art historians like Jennifer Montague, Alvar Gonzalez Palacios, uh, Marco Chiarini, our director Frederick Cummings at the time, curator of European art, and many others, uh, Gerhard Ewald, uh, work, a variety of different people brought together extraordinary works of art and show the importance of these uh, sculptures by Soldani, Fondini, Piamontini, and painters, and the importance of decorative arts. Um, then I remember seeing this as a graduate student in Florence. When I came to the DIA, I had an idea in my mind. I was working at the Victorian Albert Museum and living in London and also moving back and forth to Florence because I was working on a, my PhD was on a Florentine Renaissance sculptor named Pietro Torrigiani, but I envisioned doing a, organizing an international exhibition to celebrate the 600th uh, birthday of anniversary of Donatello, the great greatest invented, inventor of, uh, in the Renaissance and certainly in the 15th century. Uh, uh, and I organized an exhibition that opened for our 100th anniversary in Detroit uh, for the 100th anniversary of the founding of the museum in 1885 to 1985. We had the show, I don't know if you, the catalog is hard to read, but it was Italian. Renaissance sculpture in the time of Donatello. It wasn't going to be only Donatello, but the great other sculptors in the ambiente around Donatello. And in, that went to Florence the following uh, spring and summer when Florence was the cultural capital of Europe. It had a record breaking attendance. It was at the Forte Belvedere. It was a, a glorious. We brought many other manu monumental work uh, by Donatello into that show. It was called Donatello A.E. Suoi that I organized with Giorgio Bonsanti and other colleagues. Uh, a decade or so later, I began working on another exhibition, and Florence was very generous in supporting major loans for the exhibition we had in the, the Art Institute of Chicago and the DIA in 2002 and three, uh, the Medici, Michelangelo, and the art of the late Renaissance Florence. And it, for the first time, uh, you can see on the cover of the Italian version of the catalog, Michelangelo e le arte a Firenze, 1537 to 1631, for the first time ever, an Italian museum lent a marble by Michelangelo. We had the Apollo uh, David or the David Apollo from the 1530s, uh, wonderful figura serpentinata uh, marble that was lent abroad for the, as I say, the first time ever, as well as many other extraordinary works from the uh, Studiolo, uh, Francesco I, and treasures, sculpture, paintings, decorative arts, a glorious exhibition that we were proud to have. And, and so, I've had a long-standing collaboration. The museum's had a long-standing collaboration. What I didn't mention is when we, after the Twilight of the Medici, the two mayors of Detroit and Florence um, uh, signed it. And we, there was a, at the time, there's called the Renaissance Center. It was built by the Ford Motor Company. And uh, ironically, it's now owned by the General Motors Company, but it's nevertheless called the Renaissance Center. Um, and in Detroit uh, and Florence uh, entered into this, uh, was a, there was a cultural proclamation declaring a cultural sister cities uh, relationship that led to uh, these other exhibitions that I was able to cultivate. Um, Detroit on the signage, when you came into town at the time, it said Detroit, the Renaissance city on the actual signs when you entered the town, founded 1701. So there's this Renaissance has been going on. In fact, in the last decade, uh, the city looks dramatically better and different and, and new restaurants, new businesses, new young people moving in. So, so if we move on, um, to the next slide, please. Um, I was asked to yep. talk a little bit about what inspired me. Thank, so, Catherine, thank you, want thank to you Alan. That, that's exactly what I wanted you to discuss now is, is the inspiration for the choice of these 
four bronzes, which constitutes the first ever loan of this group together. Thank you very much. Um, well, I guess it was just a, 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 a brainstorm, a, a lightning flash that I, we have in our collection, we're very fortunate, as you mentioned earlier, to have one of the best collections of Italian Renaissance painting, sculpture, and decorative arts. And in the 15th century Florentine uh, gallery, uh, one of our great treasures, very rare, is to have a, a 15th century uh, unique bronze by Antonio del Polaiuolo that is of Judith, triumphant Judith, after having just slayed Holofernes. Uh, it's considered the earliest bronze statuette by Polaiuolo. It date, dates to the late 1460s. Alison Wright, who did the Polaiuolo show, said it was the earliest bronze. And I wanted to show it uh, in, in relationship with the great uh, Bargello bronze of the uh, Polaiuolo, Hercules, and Antaeus, um, considered the earliest Renaissance bronze statuette conceived to be seen in the round. And uh, I was, so I was rather bold in asking the director, Paula Augustino, whom I had known and respected, and we were friends for two decades or so, um, if we could borrow that uh, to show together in, our, in, in, our, in a special case we'll, we're designing, but to also include, so, so uh, maybe just to go back for a moment, I proposed about 12 years ago what, after the um, big financial crisis and the layoffs and museums and people throughout the world experienced uh, in 2008, 9, and 10, that for smaller exhibitions, we might have a different guests of honor or art in focus exhibitions. Um, our now director, formerly the curator of paintings and uh, Salvador Salvador Pons organized a, some wonderful shows of five Spanish painters with one. He borrowed a Van Gogh, the Bedroom at Arles. Uh, um, I, in 2016, arranged for important small guests of honor from, well, it was a uh, terracotta, a beautiful hand model terracotta by the great English 18th century uh, sculptor named Michael Reisbrack. It's the only example where he did a, a portrait of a young boy named John Bernard in 1744 in terracotta, very beautifully and creatively Model, model, and the Met has the marble for this. So we brought these two together in Detroit in 2016. It then went on, it was here for about a year or so, and then it went on to the uh, Met for the opening of their new English galleries when they opened. Um, subsequently in 2019, I worked with the Musée de Louvre and we were able to borrow two uh, beautiful terracottas by Jean-Antoine Houdon, looking at American, Houdon's portraits of the American revolutionaries. And we have one of his best marbles of uh, Robert Fulton. And we brought that in, a, in actually in our American gallery surrounded by other paintings and textiles and drawings and prints of Washington and Franklin. And it was, we had over a hundred thousand school children attending that. It was just before COVID hit. Um, and so we haven't been able so, to do any recently, but then uh, it came to one, Catherine. So Alan, I just wanted to ask what those sound like fantastic guests of honor um, exhibitions. What do you see your audience, which I'm sure will be um, significant, gaining from this juxtaposition? What is, what is your um, intent of these four bronzes, which we will be introduced to on the next slide? Um, we, uh, the, um, the revival or the creation of the bronze statuette in the 15th century, particularly in Florence, was one of the most intimate and most important revivals. Uh, there was the revival of the, bronze, of the, of the marble statue, of the, of the relief sculpture, of, of um, many different art genre forms that occurred in 15th century Florence, beginning with Brunelleschi and Ghiberti's competition reliefs, 1401, that are in the Bargello. We are, I, I like um, educating and encouraging young people and people of all ages, but we're, we want this to be something that would be well received by high school students, um, by the public, to understand there's a new concept of exploring the human anatomy and human emotions. And there's a new uh, interest in bronze casting techniques that are yeah. th that's created in 15th century Italy. So um, we have, first as you see in this slide, been able to bring together the four bronzes from the Bargello to be shown with our own Judith, but also in the context of the Donatello terracotta. We have another Donatello relief I'll show you in a moment. I will yeah. get to it eventually. I mean, I won't leave that in a moment. Um, and 
and it's in a room with other major paintings by, I'll show you those, Benozzo Gozzoli, Fra Angelico, Botticelli, et cetera. Um, we're very fortunate to have this collection that was established by William Valentiner, who we'll come back to at the end of the talk about his significance. And it was really his inspiration to acquire major works that could never be acquired today. The Judith yeah. was bought in 1937. It was shown in London at the Burlington Fine Arts uh, Exhibition in 1879, acquired by Valentiner uh, from uh, the, Sir William Drake's family and Mrs. Hornsby Drake uh, through an intermediary, a very enlightened purchase, um, actually paid for by Mrs. Edsel Ford, uh, one of our great patrons. So let's go on. Yes, I'm, let's, um, let's introduce the audience to the four bronzes that you've, um, that you've discerningly selected from what is a very large and important collection at the Bargello. I just wanna take a moment to say that while this is the first time these four bronzes have been loaned as a group, which is exciting, certainly exciting, um, they have individually made huge contributions to very important exhibitions um, already in uh, America. And many of these particular loans under the auspices of Paolo D'Agostino, who is just finishing her second term, so eight years as, as director at the Bargello. Um, Paola has been immensely generous in her loans um, at the Bargello. Now, given the importance of the collection overall, there are a lot of restrictions on what can be loaned and, and, and what cannot be loaned. But Paola has really pushed those boundaries in a lot of very important ways. And going back to one of the intents of the Friends of the Bargello, this has just really helped uh, expand our audience and to enlarge the, the sort of impact of the Bargello collections on a worldwide audience, because it isn't a highly visited museum, um, despite the collection being world class. And so by breaking down some of these barriers and, and really pushing to get these loans through, Paola has been very instrumental during her tenure um, in expanding the audience. Uh, uh, and we're all very grateful to her for that. The, but the pugilist, the first uh, to the left of this group, um, was in, a, in the Verrocchio exhibition at the Natural, National Gallery Washington in 2019, 2020. And it was the first ever monographic uh, exhibition um, in America on Verrocchio. The curator was Andrew Butterfield, and within the exhibition, he, he made various introductions, uh, convincingly uh, argued a few new attributions to Verrocchio, one of which is indeed this pugilist. Um, and then the second, uh, the uh, Hercules and Antaeus, uh, was an important loan uh, made in 2019 to a, the wonderful exhibition called the Renaissance Nude, which was at the Getty and, and also at the Royal Academy in London. Uh, and then uh, more recently, the Bertoldo Orpheus, which happens to be one of my absolute favorites, <laughs> um, was uh, in the uh, first ever monographic exhibition on Bertoldo um, at the Frick in 2019, um, a magnificent uh, exhibition and very daring too, uh, focusing on a sculptor of huge, huge importance, but very, very little known. And the majority of the corpus of Bertoldo's documented works comes from the Bargello. They are housed at the Bargello. And it is true, uh, as the curators at the Frick have also stated, that the Bertoldo exhibition could literally not have happened without the Bargello loans. Um, and that was a, a very, very important that the Bargello was, uh, was um, able to, to make those significant loans. And then the last uh, by Antico, the um, Eros or Cupid uh, pulling a bow was in the very lavish exhibition at between the Frick and the National Gallery, which was exquisitely curated by Eleonora Luciano and Denise Allen who's now at the Metropolitan Museum, but was in uh, 2012, the curator at the Frick. So as you can see, these have been to America often in, you know, the, often in the first ever exhibitions of these sculptors. Um, but today uh, at the DIA, they're being loaned as a group. 
So, Alan? Well, yes, I, th it. I wanted to also add to what Catherine just summarized um, that John Paul Penancy, who whom I studied and and Butterfield did as well, um, attributed the pugilist uh, as an early work of Donatello and credited Donatello with inventing the concept of the bronze statuette uh, because of his. You, many of you have just seen the show at the V&A or Berlin or particularly Florence, where we saw the um, the putti from the uh, Siena baptismal font that are while they're part of a larger composition, a larger monument. You could take them. There have been if you look at them independently, they look like a bronze statuette. Um, it wasn't, it, Popenesi dated the pugilist of 1435 to 40. Um, Andrew very w wisely, after he finished his monograph in 1997 on Verrocchio, wrote an article for Small Bronzes of the Renaissance. I'll come back to this later and published this in 19, um, in 2001 as part of the corpus of, of, of uh, the proceedings of the, uh, of the exhibition. But I wanted to bring these together because they show, in a way, the beginnings, the very beginnings of the development of the bronze statuette in early Renaissance Florence. And what also is interesting is the first three are all direct casts, the very sort of initial uh, method of understanding the bronze casting, where you do not, you can only make one, and these are all unique. There's no other example of any of these in the world for the first three because they're direct casts. Whereas Antico was one of the very first to invent and use the indirect casting bronze method. And there's another version of this in the Rijksmuseum. I'm sorry the slide is so dark. Hopefully those of you, you know, may um, be able to see it better, but it has this beautiful gilding. Antico is known for surpassing the ancients. He was beloved by the Mantua family, the ruling family, the Gonzagas, Isabella de Este. I think we should go on in the spirit of time. Yes. We have a lot of yes. not much. I know we have we have so much wonderful information uh, to come that I that I do need to to, to uh, go forward. You're right. I'm sorry. I think I just skipped. No, I didn't. Right. Um, so uh, Benedetta, I would love if you could speak um, about the history of this room and and really explaining what is it about the bar what is it about the collections at the Bargello that make them really exceptionally important yeah, this uh, um, slide shows uh, an old photograph from the Bargello photographic archive uh, which represent the uh, seconda sala uh, dei bronzi and uh, um, uh, from uh, the door on the left uh, we have uh, uh, a glimpse to the uh, the first the prima sala uh, dei bronzi these uh, two rooms uh, uh, hosted uh, since uh, 1865 uh, the uh, ancient uh, core of the bronzes uh, in the uh, bargello and uh, the two uh, rooms uh, um, are currently devoted uh, to the um, Maiolica collection and the 14th uh, century sculpture on uh, uh, the first floor uh, of the museum. Uh, we can here easily recognize uh, the Mercurio flying by Giambologna, the uh, Cosimo for the first by Benvenuto Cellini, the Attis Amore by Donatello and the David by Verrocchio. They all are uh, incredibly uh, famous and uh, uh, um, wonderful uh, masterwork uh, belong uh, to the Medici and uh, suitable uh, transferred uh, in 19th century from the Gabinetto dei Bronzi Moderni in the Galleria degli Uffizi uh, to the uh, Bargello. The importance of the artist and the uh, relevance of the provenance uh, make the uh, Bargello Bronze Collection so uh, unique. Um, uh, if, the, the ancient course uh, dates back, of course, uh, to the early uh, Medici period when they lived in the Palazzo in, Med in Via Larga. And, uh, um, but we have to remember that uh, Cosimo I was uh, one of the family members who contributed the most uh, to the development uh, of the uh, collecting of the bronze collecting. Um, Cosimo transferred in 1540 uh, 
uh, the collection in the scrittoio di Calliope in the Palazzo della Signoria uh, and uh, showing a great appreciation uh, not only for the statues but also uh, for the production of the small bronzes, uh, the statuette that uh, Alan a uh, few minutes ago uh, talked about. Uh, the, the bronzetto uh, was intended, intended not, not only as a replica from, from the antique but uh, an autonomous work uh, uh, that could be explored from multiple angles, uh, pick it up and turn by hands. And uh, so it was uh, set after as a precious collector's items and also it was commissioned as a diplomatic gift. Uh, the, uh, in 1889, uh, uh, the bronze collection was joined, uh, of course, by the small uh, bronzes uh, part of the uh, important uh, uh, collection of the French dealer Louis Carran. And uh, in 1971, uh, the small bronzes reached the uh, room current known as Sala dei Bronzetti on the second floor. Thank you, Benedetta. I think that becomes obvious to all of us that the provenance and history of the collection is probably the um, the salient characteristic of the Bargello collections that make it such a touchstone within so many areas, not just sculpture and bronzes, but uh, but the the sometimes called minor arts as well. Yeah. Um, so the next slide, um, I'd like to uh, to introduce here Demetrios, who can speak about this is the current installation of the Bronzetti room and obviously a um, a baby of Dimitri, this room. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. This is <laughs> how, how it looks today. Um, it is a um, display that goes back to the 1980s. Um, it is dated today, but for the time it was quite um, revolutionary. I mean, it was not badly lit and you can take the bronzes out relatively easily and study them, which many bronze lovers do. Um, the choice was to show everything. Uh, we should remind perhaps that the Bargello has almost 400 bronzes, uh, most of which have a Medici provenance. There is a large canon pub, as Benedetta said before that. Um, we, as the friends of the Bargello, have invented, invested in the study of this uh, corpus by um, financing archival research on the history of each piece and also uh, on the technical analysis of these bronzes. And we hope to be able to continue that, leading at the end to a new display of the bronzes in that room. I mean, it has the advantage to have natural light from both sides, but perhaps the one or the other um, uh, change can be contemplated. And the more we learn about the bronzes, the more this is going to help us with a new proposal for a display. And, and Dimitri, the publication is, of course, ongoing as well. Yes, we have yeah. already most entries on the Venetian and Paduan bronzes and most technical data on those, and we are now planning to complete the uh, technical analysis on this first group of Venetian and uh, Padron bronzes, many of which are uh, from the Karen collection. Right, and this is a project that the Friends of the Bargello are heavily uh, invested in, but it's exceedingly important uh, as it's this collection has not been published before, so it's with great excitement that this project is going on and happening and a, and a group of uh, wonderful scholars are, are working away um, on all aspects of publicizing uh, new images, as Dimitri said, as well as uh, internal measurements and uh, scientific analysis. So uh, that's very exciting. And so this, we, uh, for example, we also had photographed now for Alan, it's very hard to photograph. Um, we made a photographic campaign from um, many sites. Um, um, unfortunately, it cannot be displayed yet in such a way that it can be seen from all sites. 
but um, um, the photographs help at the moment. Shall I? Here we yes, are. Yes, here they are. Um, 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 you mentioned how revolutionary this bronze was in the history of, uh, of bronze, um, of the bronze statuette. It is universally accepted as a work by Polaiolo, although it is actually only documented first in 1559 in the, um, with Cosimo de' Medici, whom uh, Bettendetta first mentioned. It's important that it has a base, um, which is uh, cast with the two figures. And of course, anyone who looks at it thinks immediately um, uh, of the great uh, mannerist moment of the bronze um, statuette. I mean, artists like Gian Bologna uh, certainly looked uh, at it very closely. And so of course did, and we know this, um, Leonardo. So Alan has a very good taste and he was given a very exquisite loan. <laughs> <laughs> if I may add uh, Dim what Dimitri is saying, um, this is the first example in the Renaissance where an artist, in this case, Antonio Palaiolo, uh, took a, a two-figure group and put it on a triangular base. So it has three optimal different viewing sides. It's not quite, it's sort of basically in the round, it's not quite the figura serpentinata, but it's very close. But you can look at these slides of four different views and see that the first, the third, and the fourth are all very good views. But the one in the number two is not a very good view. It's bad. And uh, so uh, Plywell may well have been inspired by Donatello's Judith and Holofernes, uh, which is on a, a triangular base, which was meant to be seen by four sides, and was installed into the courtyard of Palazzo uh, Medici in 1464, just before, you know, just in the same decade, probably. There, there are various datings of this, by the way, and although previously people thought it was dated 1475, like Pope Hennessy and Francis A. Lewis, um, it's been moving backwards in time. Gas David Davide Gasparato is dated to the 1460s. Allison Wright's at 1470. Uh, she put the Palaio Judith in the 1460s. So nevertheless, it's a fascinating, beautiful, it's a world-class masterpiece, no question about it. But, um, and it, you know, it, we're very fortunate. We're very fortunate to have these four bronzes from the Bargello. I think, Catherine, we should be moving on, no? Yes, here you can I see think. detail. How to photograph, of course, the expression. I mean, we need more detailed photographs. We're doing this also for our project. We might want to say that it represents Hercules and Antaeus. Antaeus was a giant who was considered the strongest man on Earth. His mother was Mother Earth. And Hercules, and on one of his sort of, one of, during one of his uh, twelve flavors of Hercules, <clears throat> he fought with Antaeus, was able to uh, crush his power by lifting him off of the earth, so he could not touch the earth. He eventually strangled him, and uh, but it's really a battle of two giants, two the most powerful, you know, people, men, and uh, a wonderful, very dramatic composition. The next work uh, that um, I think. I had mentioned was once attributed to Donatello, but Andrew Butterfield, I think it wasn't very difficult sort of to accept that Donatello attribution, but Andrew made a very convincing case in an article that he published in the, uh, in the results of proceeding of small bronzes of the Renaissance. It's in Studies of the History of Art, published in 2001, volume 62, the symposium papers on Verrocchio and the bronze statuette. And uh, we're going to go through, uh, this shows the fighter, the pugilist, um, uh, probably inspired by antiquity. We don't fly all went to Rome. We look at the next view, it's the back. Um, this entered the Medici collection in 1589. Um, and, uh, and it's now, it was in the Verrocchio 2019 exhibition at the National Gallery of uh, Art that Andrew helped to curate. If we look at the back, we see Andrew made very convincing comparisons to the silver altar of of um, St. John the Baptist done by Palaiuolo, particularly the, <clears throat> looking at the executioner, these muscular muscles on the arm, one muscle going up the arm, very similar to what we see in the executioner. The, uh, the, the hammering, you go next slide, please. The um, uh, technical surface is quite different, maybe from other bronzes of the Renaissance, but there's a good comparison to the, uh, to the David and Goliath, particularly the head of Goliath that's hammered. Uh, it's, uh, it's a statue, not a statuette. Uh, it dates about 1465, made for the Medici. And there's 
uh, and this type of uh, a furrow brow and the high cheekbones, also very similar to uh, the St. John the Baptist on the silver altar or the, uh, the soldier uh, with a mace for the beheading of St. John the Baptist. So there's very, some very interesting comparisons. And furthermore, uh, I'm going to go rather quickly because I know we have more slides to cover in limited time. This uh, was inspired by ancient sculpture. And we show you just one very important world famous or European famous exhibition of the Dioscuri. Um, I think we have a view of the Dioscuri, the uh, horse tamers of the uh, Piazza del Quirinale in Rome. And we show a reflection of the study of the Dioscuri from the second century AD uh, in marble, uh, of course, a monumental, uh, uh, but you see the same raised arm and sort of almost in this fighting position. And then drawn by Benozzo Gozzoli, um, not sure when, maybe the 1460s, could be the same time. Uh, uh, and this is in the British Museum in London. And so it was a wildly popular, well-known uh, uh, ancient sculpture uh, known to 15th century uh, Florentine and other uh, Renaissance artists. And, and uh, I think that Cull could have inspired this pugilist in the Bargello, uh, now I think pretty convincingly and more recently attributed to Barocchio. So Barocchio and Palaiuolo, along with Bertoldo, are really the second generation following Donatello but they're the ones that really, in my opinion, advanced the bronze statuette. Filarete did a, a equestrian uh, bronze statuette early on in 1442, I believe. But this really this next generation uh, that is responsible for creating some of these masterpieces that we're very fortunate to be borrowing. I think Benedetta is going to speak to us about the Orpheus. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Uh this uh, third statuette is another extraordinary example of the great season of uh, Renaissance uh, uh, bronzes, and uh, I, uh, I am agree. I agree with uh, Dimitri that also in this case Alan had uh, an extraordinary taste uh, <laughs> selecting this uh, <laughs> this uh, uh, masterpiece for his. Uh, for the exhibition in Detroit, um, so he, um, it was made. It represent Orpheus, the Greek mythological uh, poet and uh, musician, and it was made by Bertoldo di Giovanni about in 1471. Uh, Bertoldo uh, was uh, is known uh, uh, to have been uh, one of the Donatello pupils and to have uh, collaborated with the master in the enterprise of the um, pulpit reliefs uh, for the Medici Church of San Lorenzo. And so here we can see Berto, we can see Orpheus um, uh, represented uh, almost uh, uh, entirely nude, uh, wonderful nude. Uh, may I have the next uh, slide? Uh, yes, uh, 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 wearing on his uh, shoulder the draped, the draped uh, animal uh, skin. And um, he he's playing his uh, lyra and the uh, serpentine pose, uh, the figure mov movement, uh, uh, give us the impression that Orfeo is dancing uh, um, to the rhythm of his uh, own, music, own music. And uh, uh, has widely uh, explained in the uh, exhibition catalog at the free collection, uh, probably Bertoldo cast by himself uh, the uh, bronze with uh, the lost wax method. And uh, even if Bertoldo was killed in the bronze work, uh, this surface seems uh, quite rough and unfinished in some part, especially the instrument, the musical instrument and the arm. So there are some uh, uh, technical problems uh, and due to these problems probably Bertoldo left the statuette uh, uh, unfinished. Um, maybe Alan wanted to wants to add something about the next uh, slide. Uh, I think I think part of this unfinished nature of this bronze is what makes it so magnificent because yeah yeah absolutely we have, yes we, we have the privilege to see the an, an extreme almost intense the degree yes. of finish on the face yes juxtaposed by really just a just a sketch um, within other areas on the bronze so I think it adds to its sort of lyrical uh, whether it was purposeful or not, which it was likely not to be, of course, he was probably going to finish it to the same degree as, as, the, um, as the right side of the face. But it does permit us in hindsight, a, lot, a real vision into how this magnificent sculptor worked. 
I think it, in itself, okay. it's like shows the whole, uh, the, the wide range of uh, bronze casting mm -hmm. from unfinished to finished. And yeah. you see one bronze, exactly. you can study how a bronze is actually made and yeah. finished. Um, it also is the largest and it's the earliest mm -hmm. of any of the bronze statuettes that Bertoldo made. So it's, it's fascinating in that regard. And interestingly enough, um, it so none of these bronzes that were now in the Medici collection were commissioned by the Medici. And this bronze was uh, acquired as an ancient bronze, as an ancient antiquity uh, from a Stefano Lali, who was an agent to Cosimo I, who acquired this as an ancient bronze. And it wasn't until 1925 that Wilhelm von Bode uh, identified it as Bertoldo. And 1925, in a book on Bertoldo and Lorenzo de' Medici, and it wasn't until 1992 that James Draper, who wrote his dissertation and published then a monograph on Bertoldo, uh, the sculptor to the Medici and his catalog resume. So I think, and, and, and also the figura serpentinata goes on to influence um, Michelangelo, John Bologna, this whole twisting turning movement, the spiral, um, very important. Um, maybe go on, we should move. I think we need to move more quickly, we have 10 minutes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, Benedetta, if you. Yes, I'd, li yes, I'd like also to recall that uh, Alan said we, uh, we, we know that in 1556 uh, uh, the statuette was donated to, to, to Cosimo I. Uh, um, there is a mention about uh, the works uh, in a document of 1471, but we know that it was really celebrated over the century. As we understand, we can understand uh, by its uh, presence. Uh, in the uh, Tribuna degli Uffizi, here represented uh, uh, in a detail from the famous uh, painting by Jon Zoffany. Wonderful. Yeah. And then briefly, uh, this too, which is a magnificent juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Um, I uh, like also to um, uh, to recall to remind, as Alan said, that uh, Bode uh, recognized uh, he was the first scholar to recognize Bertold, the refuse as a Bertold work, and uh, he uh, yes he, he he gave an important title uh, Bertold to his book Bertold un Lorenzo de Medici, and the title uh, recalls the very rela special relationship between Bertold and Lorenzo de Medici. Lorenzo let Bertoldo move uh, to live in uh, uh, Palazzo in, in Via Larga, Medici in Via Larga, and uh, gave him the role of the curator of the Giardino di San Marco, where uh, he probably met uh, uh, Michelangelo. And uh, the uh, importance of the influence uh, uh, of Bertoldo on Michelangelo can be seen in this uh, comparison between uh, the Orpheus and the Apollo, the Cupid Apollo by a, made by a young Michelangelo in, uh, in uh, the Metropolitan Museum. So Bertoldo uh, can, must be regarded as a linking figure between Donatello and, uh, and Michelangelo, absolutely. And may I point something out which comes to my mind? This is one of these new <laughs> photographs and I think it's a very rare point of view and mm -hmm. I asked specifically yeah. for I it agree. to be yeah. made because a camera lens that is uh, made perpendicular to the to the foot. So you, you have a view which you actually would yeah. have to see in, 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 in standard photographs, but which I think is revealing also for yeah. understanding um, the composition. Yeah, it's very good. It's very good uh, angle. And, and I agree. I don't think it's been seen before. But it is extraordinary, Benedetta, to, to hear, you know, the obvious history, which a lot of us do know about the relationship with Bertoldo and the Medici, and just that things that he made could get lost. Like, you know, that, yeah, that, that it's just extraordinary. I mean, it makes this world of Renaissance bronzes so complex, where even someone with as close a relationship to the Medici as Bertoldo, works that he made, a significant work that he made, can get somehow sort of lost in translation and only discovered, you know, sort of centuries later as not an antique. But in fact, it's really extraordinary and, and adds to the mystique and excitement, I suppose, in this area of research. We'll just move on now to the last of the four the bronzes. Last, yes, here we are in a different world, the world of Mantua. Uh, this is a bronze which was probably in the collection of Cardinal Giovanni Francesco uh, Gonzaga. 
And um, it did come to the Bargello, not through the Medici, but through the Caran collection, which was mentioned by Benedetta. I mean, the Bargello is inconceivable without the Caran collection, which is a huge gift of a Kunstkammer of the 19th century. It includes everything. And also some very important um, non-Florentine bronzes. And um, this is interesting, uh, certainly for Alan, because it's the type of bronze that is exquisitely finished. And uh, it's a different aesthetic than the one we have seen until now, but it is one that has survived and in the world of Giambologna and of his followers. So in a way, it somehow also anticipates Florentine uh, bronze uh, statuettes of the mannerism and the Baroque. And it is um, one of the first artists who makes uh, bronze statuettes, who makes them in such a way that they can be replicated. So we are again anticipating here uh, later Florentine um, developments, but not only Florentine, of course. Should we move to, yes, Benedetta can tell us. No, uh, Benedetta, yeah. you have an interesting point to make. Yeah, about so I, I'd like also to, yes, to, 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 to recall that uh, uh, the, the Cupid was uh, first uh, shown, uh, exhibited in uh, 1887. At the day, Donatello exhibition at the Bartello. Uh, so here we see an old photograph uh, of the Salone dell'Udienza, dell later named the Salone di Donatello, during the, exhib the exhibition. The Cupid wasn't shown there, but uh, as Dimitri said, it was at the second floor, a part of the section devoted to the Luis Carran collection. And in the catalog, it was uh, uh, described as uh, un amorino uh, in bronze, con le ali capelli dorati extraordinary uh, extraordinarily attributed to Donatello so it was connected um, to the the master that at that time all the scholars uh, considered the revolutionary artist in the creation of bronze uh, uh, sculpture and uh, so this is, is important to recall uh, in my opinion I think. Yeah, of course. And again, goes back to the the complex mm, yes. uh, legacy of, of art history behind, behind these bronzes. So um, in this slide, we have this wonderful juxtaposition of the early court at the Detroit Institute of Art and that today at the Bargello. It's a 1920s image, which I thought <clears throat> looked nice together. And I think we can begin now to talk, um, Alan, about the this extraordinary physical and uh, curatorial legacy uh, between these two wonderful museums. So thank you. Um, yes, and I'm going to have to be brief because we still have a number of slides left and not so many minutes left. Yeah. So uh, um, in 1921, the head of our board of directors who was named Ralph Harmon Booth, we'll see in a moment, hired William Valentiner to be first a consulting curator, and by 1924 became the director of the Detroit Institute of Arts, and he remained so until he was required to retire at the age of 65 in 1945. And he came from uh, being the assistant to Wilhelm von Bode in Berlin, and also uh, with Bode's recommendation, he had been previously the first curator of you know, decorative arts and sculpture, not just European, but everything that wasn't a painting and wasn't an antique work of art. There were three curators to be the first curator at the Metropolitan Museum during Decorative Arts. He was there from 1907 until 14. He was Boda's assistant from 1904, 1904 until 1905 until seven. And he came with the idea of building a new museum that Ralph Booth encouraged. And, and uh, so what his major influence was, was the Bargello. And the courtyard of the Bargello, we see here on the right, um, an open air courtyard with a large stairs. Valentina acquired coats of arms from Italy, from Tuscany, 15th, 16th, mostly 14th, 15th, and 16th century, embedded into the wall. He created this uh, open air courtyard. Uh, we also, he uh, worked with the uh, Edsel and Eleanor Ford family to acquire the Donatello coat of arms that is, that is even larger than the Martelli coat of arms, each given to Donatello uh, or Donatello and Desiderio. The Martelli is 193 centimeters tall. Ours is 216 centimeters high. 
Um, I years ago with Brenda Pryor, I, I discovered which palazzo in Florence this coat of arms came from. It's from the Bono the Boni family in Viet, near Via Tornaboni. It was torn down in the early 19th century, and it was then acquired by the Ford family and given to the museum in 1941. Um, so these coats of arms, these are two monumental coats of arms by Donatello, but there are other coats of arms you see in, on the staircase. Uh, let's go on uh, for lack of time. I'll try to be brief, and I think they can be. Um, so so I'll, just, I'll just run through. Oh, what happened? Um, something. So let me... Excuse me. <laughs> so how did you try, come on, I'm going to, we have a few minutes, Catherine. I'm going to take over, if I may, and run through these last slides because we have about 10. Um, we have... We have Donatello, as I've shown you. We have Ghiberti, Luca della Robbia was in the Donatello show in the BNA. We have different sculptures by Andrea della Robbia. This one was featured in the della Robbia show at the Natural Gallery in Boston. We have North Italian, it's wonderful, these are monumental bronzes acquired as a Sansovino, Jacopo Sansovino. I found and done a large, long article of Danese Catania, Mars and, and Neptune. We have other works by John Bologna. Um, next slide. We have paintings by Benozzo Gozzoli, Frangelico. Uh, Benozzo Gozzoli and Frangelico were gifts to the Ford family. Interestingly enough, Valentino gave us the Botticelli and he gave us many uh, works of ceramics and Maiolica. He was, he was knowledgeable in many areas and he gave us even a great painting by Francis Bacon. That's another uh, room for another uh, talk um, going on. I wanna connect some of the galleries and this is a, you see here in this wonderful slide, uh, Catherine helped write the, the byline, American Museum can, capable of telling a comprehensive narrative of the Italian Renaissance made a perfect storm of a few great European influencers and the deeply generous philanthropic commitment of two families, the Edsel Fords and the Booths. So we see Valentino taught, he lived in Gross Point at what's called now our War Memorial, but it was a Venetian palazzo um, done by a famous architect on the shores of Lake St. Clair, a very beautiful setting. He lived there and downstairs was a decorative arts Italian Renaissance decorative arts uh, outpost of the DIA in the 1930s. And Valentino taught Edsel and Eleanor Ford. She worked with the Booths and taught them about the Booth family and many others, uh, teaching them about collecting and about the Italian Renaissance and the, and the Dutch you know, 17th century paintings and even German expressionists, all of which he was a great expert of. And um, going on, this is Booth and the Fords. Uh, this is a uh, Valentino later when he's sitting at his desk in the DIA uh, and he's writing his memoirs, his autobiography. And he, and he talks about going to the Met in 1904, uh, four, five, six, seven, really five, six, and seven. Uh, so, contrary to the director's idea, I decided to, he wanted to evoke a period. It wasn't a much a period room, but to evoke a period by showing painting, sculpture, and decorative arts in one. Uh, in one area, and you give a chronological uh, 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 survey of the of the of, of, of global cultures, and so this he said this served as a model that most museums uh, were later inspired in America and that were founded all over the country. Um, I think going on, we have an image of Boda and the Boda Museum. Again, leads us back to Florence because Boda's inspiration for his way of displaying sculpture and painting actually has a Florentine source. Exactly. And, and Boda wrote the, uh, the three volume uh, study of the first study of the Italian bronze statuettes coming out in 1907. Uh, Valentina acquired some 30 uh, Italian Renaissance bronzes for the Met, uh, you know, inspired by Boda when he was there. And he required the Judith and these other sculptures I'm showing you and the paintings for the DIA. So going on. I'm going to wrap up with a few views. Well, this is, so when Valentiner came to the Met, uh, there, Morgan created a new wing. This is, shows what Valentiner installed, the Henschel collection that Morgan had acquired over a million dollars of both medieval and French uh, 18th century works of art. And he created this uh, sort of period setting. He has tapestries uh, and sculpture and decorative arts showing together. Um, he was not in charge of the painting, so he didn't use paintings. Later, when he got to the DA, he was able to integrate painting, sculpture, and decorative arts. And he published this in different articles, the importance. Boda believed in showing painting and sculpture only. Valentino took it another stage to show painting, sculpture, and decorative arts. Next slide, next view. So when Valentino, so 
with Booth's help and the trustees' help, they built a new museum. And this is the museum opened in 1927. And this is a Valentina writing and showing this is the Italian Renaissance or Florent, really a Tuscan Renaissance gallery as it was in 1930 or 1927 when it opened. Um, it's now been transformed with other acquisitions and but it, we're using it's in the same space you see here. Um, he talked about the character of the period is visualized by a knowledge of all fields in which art expresses itself. A mixed exhibition of painting, sculpture, and decorative arts has been chosen for exhibition in many different rooms. Going on, very briefly, the old museum and founded when the museum was founded in 1885, a neo-Gothic building where Valentina experimented with showing painting, sculpture, and decorative arts together in period settings. The 1927 building on Woodward Avenue. Uh, uh, which, which got awards for its design. The architect was Paul Cray, working with Valentina. Next slide. I'm going to gallop through the last few slides. Just to give you a sense, the public, a sense who's viewing our Tuscan Renaissance Gallery, where the uh, glorious four bronzes from the Bargello that are being lent will be shown along do you, with our Judith. Do, do you feel yourself bound somehow to the ideals of Valentina when you redid the galleries? We have respected our, myself and our, my colleagues, and yes, we have respected Valentiner's uh, philosophy of showing painting, sculpture, and decorative arts in our galleries. We, we are, I won't say we're unique, but we have maintained that philosophy since 1927. You know, the National Gallery, there's some segregation, the Metropolitan Museum, paintings are in one area, sculpture, they're getting, they're changing things around now. But yes, we feel, yes, there's something important. I show you the Tuscan the Renaissance, thing. I show you, What's that, Dimitri? Something important to maintain. I think the public really enjoys it. They like seeing what you're not seeing in this photograph on the right, um, on the left rather, of the Renaissance, is wonderful Maiolica and that Valentina acquired. Uh, the, we show it in another gallery, the Studiolo Gallery, basically Veneto uh, paintings and sculpture. We have Titian and Veronese and Parmigianino and Correggio and great bronzes and marbles and a table with a, with a Venetian and the Vene bronzes from the Veneto in Padua. As I'm moving on, I show you, we have a, a very fortunate to have a Medici gallery, a, a, a court art in 16th century Italy that shows primarily court of uh, Grand Ducal Medici art showing Cosimo in the corner, a bust of Cosimo by Bandini I acquired, the Eleonora by Bronzino, uh, there's wonderful bronzes by Giambologna, by Suzini, uh, and followers um, there, what you don't see um, is a, a, a beautiful Medici porcelain, might be the, arguably the largest and one of, and maybe the best Medici porcelain anywhere. Uh, Pietra Dura is a cabinet, um, a rock crystal and gold a crucifix and a fantastic collection of uh, Historiato uh, Urbino port, uh, 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 Medici, uh, Urbino Maiolica um, and who, some of which has been generously given by a, a wonderful patron that I, I think is listening on, and uh, and some of us know him um, and his and, wife. Yeah. And then finally, and also, and then, also a pa also a patron of the Bargello, and a patron of the Bargello. Yeah, yeah. it's a very yeah. uh, and, a, and one of our trustees and etc. Um, and then I'll just show you. We also have what we did in our. We totally renovated the museum in nineteen oh in two thousand and seven. We used to be just Italian art in this in the in the nineteen twenty seven building. Now we integrate. Italian with Northern European. So we have a gallery for Northern European, 15th century with painting and sculpture and some stained glass and decorative arts. Later, we have a 16th century Northern European gallery, which is you know another subject for another talk. So I'm sorry to rush through these last slides. I apologize we went over. We have two last slides. No, and, but um, it's, a, it's been a great opportunity to see these installations and to see the the, you know, I, I think most people would agree that seeing things like this, the many mediums and types is much more evocative of the period than a more sanitized uh, installation. I think it's wonderful that you've stuck to Valentino's uh, influence. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to going again to Detroit in September to see this exhibition. The last slide is just a revisit of the loan from the Bar Alan, where will they be shown the four bronzes in Detroit? They, they will be shown <laughs> in the Tuscan 15th century Renaissance okay. gallery that I showed right there. It'll be shown on a different, it'll be shown in the center of the room so you can walk around and see them from all angles, see the bronzes from all angles. There'll be a, a case approximately the size of that platform, which is good size, 60 inches by 
30 some inches and um and and there'll be and there's natural light and there's artificial light and they'll be surrounded by uh, donatello gaberti you know sculptures and paintings of 15th century tuscany so i it's a it seemed a logical place to show them as opposed to into a more sterile separate gallery you know exhibition gallery but it it, it has it and it's, it's a wonderful ceiling and the the floor is not the original but it was inspired by the original so we okay. feel it's a very you know it's just an ideal space for fortune to have and i invite the public to come to detroit between really like october 1st and march the 3rd um and we're very very grateful to the bargello to paulo d'agostino to benedetta who's going to be our courier and a speaker when we have the opening to catherine dimitri the friends of the bargello the new photographs we can't thank you enough and we just feel very, very special then. Thank you. Well, thank you. Alan, thank you for your um, collaboration and for your interest in Florence and the Bargello over all these years that you've been at the DIA. Very grateful. And there are, a, there are a couple questions um, that have come in. Um, uh, one person asks um, about the method of bronze casting, which of course is another, uh, is a very lengthy um, answer, but of course something that I certainly would love to share, um, as I'm sure you would, Alan, because um, it is so integral to the understanding of, of the production of these things um, at the date in which they were produced. Um, possibly we can share uh, the video that the VNA is sharing with you, the VNA has compiled a, a really comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, sort of tutorial um, uh, video, which was actually on view at the at the Liechtenstein in March, um, where I saw it most recently, and it's superb. And I will um, uh, make sure that uh, that um, uh, Bernadine Bennett uh, receives it because I think that's very interesting. And I know that, Alan, you'll be borrowing it as well for the exhibition, is that right? Yes, the, not yeah. only will we, it, it is part of our uh, interpretive labeling. So we will have this four minute excellent video from the Victorian Albert Museum. So you will be in this part of the exhibition, you will click on right. a QR code and you can see this or you'll be able to download and right. make it home. Um, and then I would also recommend to Bernadette there's, uh, if you look at the Met, WWW Met Museum, the Heilbronn a timeline, and, and you search for bronze casting, you get a wonderful explanation from the Met about direct and indirect casting. Okay, great. And then and another, which, another sort of puts you on the spot, Alan, but it's a, it's a great question to, to really finish on, given that we've gone over time. Um, uh, I, there's a question here saying, how would you summarize the key points of the narrative in the curated exhibition for the audience to take away and enjoy in conversation? Alan. Well, uh, the 15th century in Florence beginning with 1401 uh, was really a period of great innovation and exploration, uh, not only of uh, new ideas of naturalism, of one point perspective of uh, bronze casting, but there is a new sense of what we didn't have a time to talk about is that these artists were particularly Polaiola we know was involved with exploring anatomy. He was even involved with dissecting and uh, people were interested in how the musculature of the body, this was not allowed in the middle ages or prior to the, 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 the science, there's a lot of, there's a direct link with art and science and exploration of the body but you know, Leonardo dissection of uh, Palaiuolo, others looking at the anatomy, the musculature, the, the tendons, the veins. And, and then there's also a new sense of uh, emotion, of anguish, of drama that's created. And this is coming out through the revival and the rebirth of the bronze statuette and a, and a monumental sculpture as well. But you see this, I think, particularly in the, in the bronze statuette, what you, what we didn't talk about very much, but Benedetta broached on this was, um, the importance of the studiolo, of the of the scholar, of the of the collector, of the, the of the Medici, later, but others in in uh, throughout Italy, in, in Mantua, and in, in Padua, and Venice, so being able to pick up these bronzes, and the public can't do this now, but we will have them 
we will have a, a, a video showing the palai oil in the round and so you can see it from all sides. You can visually see it walking around it, but there'll be a video uh, we've taken uh, in with Dimitri's great help and Benedetta's and Paula's and other people with the Bargello. We've been able to make these new photographs courtesy of the friends of Bargello and showing them from different angles. So we can really see the beauty of how these are created um, and, and the innovation. Each of these are really new departures. You don't, there are ancient Roman bronzes and ancient Greek bronzes, but this is like a new world. This is a something totally different, totally new. And I wanted to be able to, for the public to see this great innovation that happened first in 15th century Florence with masters following Donatello, Waiolo, Parrocchio, Bertoldo, and then also get a sense of what's going on a little bit elsewhere because Mantua is so important for the great sculptor Antico. And I'm sorry to say we don't have an Antico, we don't have a Bertoldo, although one sculpture was called Bertoldo, but it's somebody else. And, uh, and so we're bringing works of art, masterpieces that we don't have in our own collection. And it's gonna be very exciting to have them on view uh, for those six, or six months approximately uh, later this year. And we hope some of you in the audience will be able to come and visit us. And then of course, visit the Bargello. Then yes. Well, thank you, Alan. And thank you for choosing the Bargello for your guests of honor. Um, uh, this year. My pleasure. And thank you to all I of you who have attended. And thank you, Benedetta and Dimitri and Alan. Thank you.